Well, welcome to Stone Creek Bible Church, Easter 2022. It's so exciting. Is that just amazing or what? I can't believe it. The church has been celebrating the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for almost 2,000 years. And I am just so excited. Almost, uh, some people say that 2.8 billion people around the world call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. And I don't know where that number comes from, but uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty amazing number when you think that just 2,000 years ago, there were uh, 12 disciples hiding in a room because Jesus had been crucified, and they were disappointed and discouraged and afraid, and they had no idea what was going to happen. And the Lord took the circumstances that surrounded the life of Christ and has turned it into an amazing, amazing thing. Well, Friday, I was finishing up my taxes. <laughs> Nothing like waiting until the last minute. But uh, <clears throat> I was uh, filling out my forms and signing online. And uh, then I decided to go ahead and pay the invoice from my tax lady, even though she had said that I didn't have to pay before she filed the taxes. I thought, no, it would be a good thing for me to pay that bill. And so I, I went through the process of sending her some money uh, from my checking account uh, to pay that bill. And then about five minutes later, I got an email from her and I opened it up and it was a copy of her invoice with this big red sticker on it that said paid. And I was like, oh yeah, I love that. I don't, I don't get those very much anymore because everything's just online. And uh, I was just thrilled. I, I actually had seen the money come out of my bank account because I have a little thing that tells me when money comes out of my bank account on my phone and it just pops up, you know, bing, yeah, that money's gone. And uh, then I opened up the email and I saw that paid sticker and I thought, oh, I love that, a paid sticker. It's like a gold star. It's like a little reward for doing what was right. And then I, as I sat there, I was, I, was, I was studying and I was thinking about this and I thought, my goodness, that's the resurrection. The resurrection is that big red paid sticker that says, hey, you've done what you need to do. The resurrection is the, the, the sticker on the invoice for our sin that Jesus paid on the cross at Calvary. And the resurrection says, hey, Jesus said he was going to die. Jesus said he was going to be raised again on the third day. And if that happens, then we can probably trust some of the other things that Jesus said that we don't have a way to, to see and to watch and to observe. And when the Bible says that Jesus paid for our sin on the cross at Calvary, I believe the resurrection that we celebrate on Easter is that paid sticker. It's the thing that says, yes, you know, Jesus did what he was supposed to do. And this is God's guy. And all the stuff that he told you, you can believe because... He rose from the dead on the third day. And so part of what we're celebrating today is not just a good religious holiday. It's an affirmation for who Jesus really is. And so this morning, I want to walk you through John chapter 20, and we're going to look at some people that are part of that story. But before we do that, I want to <laughs> do, just do a couple of other things. I've got a little gift here for you today. And we're going to celebrate communion before we're done. And uh, communion at Stone Creek Bible Church is not a way to earn your, your way into heaven. Communion at Stone Creek Bible Church is a way to remember what Jesus has done for us. And I believe that every one of us can remember what Jesus has done for us. And so I'd like to invite you to think about sharing communion with us this morning and what that means to you personally. Now... I am amazed that gospel writers don't spend more time talking about the theology of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all seem to follow this same idea that what they need to do is tell people what Jesus taught and tell people what they experienced and observed and not really comment on that very much. <laughs> we get plenty of commentary in the letters of Paul and some of the other places in the New Testament but the Gospels are kind of written to people who do not understand and do not know who Jesus is. And by filling in the details of his story, we are able to piece together how we should respond to the claims of the story of Jesus, the Gospel message. So, <laughs> let's see. <clears throat> 
I am going to invite you to uh, just listen to a passage of scripture from John chapter 12, verse 47 to 50. And I'm going to read from the message, which is a, which is a streamlined, uh, it's not really a translation of the Greek, it's a paraphrase. It's, it's scholars of the Greek putting, putting what they're reading into modern, simple English. And it's a quote from Jesus that took place during the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, which we celebrated last week. And one of the things Jesus told his disciples is this little short message. But it relates to our passage today and to our emphasis here on Easter Sunday. And so I wanted to read it to you so that you could kind of evaluate how you have responded to the gospel, to the gospel story, and to the calling of God in your life personally. So, John 12, 47, from the message. If anyone hears what I am saying and doesn't take it seriously. I don't reject him. I didn't come to reject the world, Jesus said. I am come to save the world. But you need to know that whoever puts me off, refusing to take in what I'm saying, is willfully choosing rejection. The word, the word made flesh that I have spoken, and that I am, that word and no other is the last word. I am not making any of this up on my own. The Father who sent me gave me orders and told me what to say and how to say it. And I know exactly what his command produces, <laughs> real and eternal life. That's all I have to say. What the Father told me, I'm telling you. Can you imagine? What the disciples must have thought when they heard Jesus tell him that? Whoa! What do you mean? You think I've got to listen to you and I've got to kind of assimilate this story and I've got to figure out how to apply that to my own life? <laughs> I was at a men's conference years ago and I remember, I'll never forget sitting there and, and uh, one of the guys next to me had listened to the introduction that the speaker gave and, and then he kind of put his head down and he shook his head. <laughs> he says, I don't want to figure it out. I just want you to tell me what I got to do. <laughs> and I, I sat there and I listened and I thought, oh my goodness, that's what so many of us think and feel, you know? Yeah, don't make me figure it out. I just want you to tell me what to do. But the gospel isn't a place where you're going to find somebody to tell you what to do. As your pastor, I'm not going to tell you what to do and how to live your life. You've got to figure that out. Why? Because I don't preach a religion, a checklist, a system of doing things that will get you points with God. No. What we teach is a Christianity that's based on faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he was God's representative. And when we enter into a relationship with him, that is what Christianity is all about. It's about being in a relationship with God. And you've got to figure that out. <clears throat> Think of my marriage to my wife of 40 years. Oh my goodness. And uh, we were married by a guy who had been her youth pastor for four years. And uh, <clears throat> I remember sitting in his office before we were married. And uh, I thought to myself that same thing, boy, I'm never going to figure this out. Just tell me what to do. Tell me how to live with this woman. You know, what are the secrets? And uh, he says, no, I can't tell you the secrets because she's the only one who knows the secrets. You have to work that out with her. And you have to figure out how to love her and how to honor her and how to treat her in a way that makes her feel loved and honored. <laughs> There's no checklist for that. There's a relationship that you commit to and that you are responsible for working on. You see, and that's the same kind of thing. The Bible uses our marriage as an illustration of our relationship to God because the same principles apply in a relationship. Principles that don't even touch a religion. And so when Jesus says to his disciples, hey, you guys are going to have to figure this out. <laughs> I think he means it. I think he's, he's telling us what to do, and it's the simple sentence. It's just, you've got to figure this out. You've got to figure out who I am. You've got to figure out what I want in your life. You've got to figure out how to turn off your car alarm. 
Now, that doesn't bother me. I've got chickens and roosters. Thank you very much over there, Mr. Rooster. And uh, I feel a lot like Jesus on Sunday morning when the roosters are crowing. I think, oh my goodness, Jesus preached outdoors with babies crying and roosters and donkeys doing crazy things on the hillside. And uh, <clears throat> I just, it's like, okay, there's distractions in life. And we've got to figure out how to focus on the things that are important, no matter what the distractions are. And that's part of what this gospel message is. It's kind of reminding us, hey, you've got an opportunity to connect with Jesus. And there's lots of distractions going on. <laughs> but you've got to figure out how to set those distractions aside and figure out what's important. So I love that. That's theology. Figuring out how to have a relationship with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the gospel writers didn't focus on theology, like I said. <laughs> they focused on characters. Oh my goodness, and the, the Easter story, the story of Jesus' last week on earth as a human being before the resurrection, the time between the triumphal entry and the crucifixion was an amazing week, and it's filled with characters. Some of them are good characters, like that rooster. <laughs> He's just over there, yeah, yeah, there was one, you know, there was a rooster in that story. And uh, yeah, there was some bad guys, Caiaphas and Pilate and, you know, some soldiers who did the crucifixion. There were some people that didn't know what they were doing and weren't committed. And they were just there to observe what was going on. And then there were some people who were committed to Jesus, but didn't really understand his purpose and what he was doing and, and, and who he was. They were just trying to figure it out. And this morning, I think that's where most of us are. We're trying to figure it out. How can I serve God? How can I love God? And how can God, how can I involve God in my life in a meaningful way? Now, who's your favorite character? I'm going to ask you just to think about, you know, pick one. Uh, probably not Caiaphas and Pilate. It might be Peter or Mary Magdalene or Mary, the mother of Jesus. Or it might be... All kinds of people. Anybody got a crazy idea? A favorite character of the Easter story that you want to share with us? Peter. Peter. There we go. That's a great character. I love that character. Absolutely. Anybody else? Favorite character? Easter Bunny. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put that distraction aside and I'm going to focus on what we're doing this morning. How about John? John. Good answer. John, the youngest apostle. And we're. And Judas? Yeah, no. Is that your favorite? Hopefully that's not your favorite character. Mary, Mary Magdalene. We're going to talk about her this morning in John chapter 20. Absolutely. Now, my favorite character, I have two favorite characters in the Easter story. I'll just tell you what, who they are quickly. One is the Roman centurion who oversaw the crucifixion. He was a guy who was trained to kill. And his job was to teach the other hundred guys that were under his authority how to kill like he could kill. <laughs> oh my goodness. This was a guy who, he knew the rules and he knew how to obey authority and he did what was required. And he hauled Jesus out there with a bunch of soldiers and they nailed him to a cross and he stood there and supervised that whole circumstance. But at the end of the circumstance, at the end of Jesus' crucifixion, he stood there and publicly announced oh my goodness, this man is the Son of God. Because he had seen something about the way Christ experienced that crucifixion that set him apart from all of the other people that that centurion had ever executed. And he was willing to make a public statement. <laughs> yeah, this was the Son of God. What was he saying? He was saying that Pilate had made a mistake. He was saying that those Jewish leaders were evil and had executed an innocent man. He was basically affirming Jesus' righteousness because of what he had seen there on the cross. And I love, that's a kind of a brave courage that I would love to be able to claim as my own. The second is Simon the Cyrene, the African guy that the soldiers pulled out of the crowd and said, hey, <laughs> you carry the cross for him because he's struggling. We don't know much about Simon. We don't read much about the story. But later on in the book of Acts, we discover that Simon had two sons, Rufus and Alexander. And uh, later on, we discover that they were leaders in the early church. And then Paul, in one of his epistles, says, Hey, <laughs> say, say thank you to Rufus and his mom, because she has been like a mom to me. And I look at that and I think, Simon the Cyrene, he got snagged out of a crowd and the soldiers made him carry Jesus' cross up that hill. But something he saw 
on that mountain that day changed his life. And his testimony changed the lives of his two sons. And his testimony changed the life of his wife, who was widowed after he passed away. She was still serving God and committed to serving Paul. Oh my goodness. Amazing characters. This morning, we're going to look at uh, two more characters. Mary Magdalene and the Apostle John in John chapter 20. And I'm going to read down through this passage with you and hope that you can follow along with me. Um, Let's see. Where are we going to begin? Verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So the soldiers were gone. The seal on the stone in front of the tomb had been broken. And there was nobody there when the women showed up. Other Gospels tell us that Mary came with some of her friends, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a few of the other women from Galilee. And they had brought spices so that they could finish the process of embalming Jesus' body. <clears throat> the stone had been rolled away. Verse 2. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. And we don't know who that is exactly. That term is used several times in the Gospel of John, and it's one of the things that Gospel writers did. They didn't put their own name in there. And so many scholars believe that this was actually uh, John, the youngest apostle, Andrew's brother, and Peter's cousin. And so... Um, they ha- she says to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So imagine Mary was panicked. She went there to grieve the loss of one of, her, one of her best friends, the Lord Jesus. Somebody who had delivered seven demons out of her life. Somebody who had transformed who she was as a person. And she was pretty determined she wasn't going to let go of that relationship. She was going to go and she was going to grieve if that's what it took. <laughs> but when the body wasn't there, she panicked. She runs and tells Peter. And so Peter and the other disciple in verse 3, they start for the tomb and both were running. (laughs) But the other disciple, the disciple that we don't know his name, the other disciple, um, oh my gosh, I lost my place. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. (laughs) There you go. Thank you. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, no doubt, panting and struggling. You know, John was probably in his 20s, uh, 2021. Peter was probably in his late 20s as a disciple of Jesus, probably 28, 27. And so that difference was enough to create a little bit of advantage for John. And so Peter shows up, and he's not going to stop at the door. He's going to go in. And what does he find? He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linens. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. And he saw and believed. And they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to be risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Oh, my goodness. So they visited the tomb. They saw the body of Jesus was missing, and they went back to their home. But there are some clues in this passage that I want you to be able to see. One of those clues is where it says that Peter went in and he looked at the linens. The normal Greek word for looking is the word blepo, and it means to see or to look or to observe. Just like, oh yeah, that bird flew by and I saw it. The word that's in this passage where Peter looked at the linens is a different word. It's a word Theodorus, and it's the word we get theater from. It's the word we get theorized from, and it's a detective word. In the, in the first century, it was a word that was described to what a detective would do. They would go and they would look to see the meaning or the implications of what they were looking at. And Peter was standing there looking at the tomb, looking at the linens in the tomb, and he was analyzing what that meant. Now, so I'm going to have a little Columbo discussion with you for just a minute. <clears throat> in the first century, families didn't bury their loved ones. They basically entombed them. And after about a year, the body would decompose, and they, they would send a family in, a member into the tomb, 
where the body would be laying on a stone shelf on one side of the tomb. And usually there was a, a bench or a shelf on the other side of the tomb so that family members could go in during the early part of that decomposition and they could grieve their lost loved one. And about a year in, when the body was decomposed, they would send someone in and he would fold up the cloths and the bones and then they would put the bones and what remained in a little stone box called an ossuary. And then usually the name of the person would be carved on the end of that box and the box would be stacked at the bottom of the tomb so they could have their whole family in there. And so when Peter goes into the tomb, he's going into the tomb to look at the body of Jesus on the shelf and we are told that the linens were still there on the shelf right where Jesus had been, had been put the night, uh, two nights before. But the, the cloth that was around his head had been neatly folded and set aside. So if you're a fan of the Shroud of Turin, um, this is a, a biblical indication that Jesus wasn't buried in a shroud. He was, his body was wrapped in cloth with spices, and then his head was covered with a, with a towel or a, some kind of a cloth. It may have actually been a prayer cloth, the tallit, that the Jews used to pray. They would cover their head with the tallit, and then they would pray. And sometimes that tallit was used as the head covering for a Jewish burial. But we don't know that from Scripture. That's just kind of scholarly speculation. What we do know from John 19 is that when Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus in the tomb, he took with him 75 pounds of spices. <laughs> 75 pounds of spices. What does that mean? Well, they would wrap the body with linen cloth and they would put in between the layers of the wrapping the spices. And so the spices, thank you very much, the spices would reduce the smell of the decomposing body for people who were there to grieve during the first few days. But 75 pounds of spices, can you imagine? You know, Jesus may have only weighed 160 pounds. My insurance company says I'm supposed to weigh 160 pounds and I, <laughs> I can't get there yet, but Jesus was probably doing that. And, uh, but the spices were half of what his weight were. What, like, what in the world? Well, that tells me that Joseph of Arimathea was planning on a long grieving process. He was planning on going to spend time in prayer there by the body of Jesus, probably for days, probably for months. He may have had a plan to go there in grieving the loss of this friend that he believed in, you know, every month for that year before he folded up the bones and, and put them in the box. We don't know. But the amount of spices that he brings tells us that he was not planning on a resurrection. He was planning on a long period of grief. Oh my goodness, that's significant. The other thing that's significant about those cloths laying there on the ledge, as Peter looked at them, he must have asked himself, well, if robbers came and stole this body, they spent a lot of time unwrapping it first. Why would you unwrap the body if you were going to steal it? You wouldn't. You would grab the body and you would run as fast as you can so you didn't get caught. You wouldn't spend an hour and a half unwrapping. It doesn't make sense. And if the body had been taken by disciples who were trying to prove that maybe Jesus had been resurrected, you know, the, the fake resurrection theory, why would they have unwrapped Jesus' body and dishonored it by carrying it out of the tomb naked, leaving the clothing behind? That doesn't make sense either. I wonder if these things were what was going through Peter's mind. Like, what has happened here and who could have done this? And why would they have done this? And the only thing that would have made sense to Peter was that Jesus' body had somehow got out of that, those, those grave clothes. Oh my goodness, something's happened here that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand this. And they went home to try and figure it out. Now, this is an amazing part for me as a pastor because as I read through the gospel narratives, the details like this become a part of the evidence, the trail of evidence for the truth in the gospels. And this passage tells me that even Peter was thinking that he should be able to figure out what God was doing. Something had happened that was important and he needed to figure it out. And this is where it began. So I love that part of this passage. Peter, 
was thinking about what in the world had taken place. Now, in verse 11, the second part of this passage is not about Peter. It's about Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary Magdalene, as I said, was a young woman who was born in a fishing village called Magdala on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. It was on the, the road from, um, from the Middle East, from what we call now Baghdad, used to be called Babylon. And there was actually a highway from Babylon down into Egypt and Cairo. And that highway went around the north end of the Sea of Galilee down to the village of Magdala, where the, where the caravans would pick up a, a, a supply of, of dried fish. It was a fishing village. They would pick up a supply, of, a supply of dried fish, and then they would use that as their food as they traveled down through Israel, through the Sinai, and into Egypt. And so Mary grew up in this town that was... A small fishing village, yes, about 40,000 people lived there uh, in 68 AD when the Romans came and attacked. We know that from the historical records. She grew up in this village, but it wasn't just a peaceful fishing village. It was a village on the highway. It was a village where the caravan drivers would come and they would be looking for food and they would be looking for water and they would be looking for some fun when they camped out at the fishing village, getting ready to go down the next leg of their journey to Egypt. Now, I don't know what it meant for Mary to have had seven demons, but I imagine that that was a significant part of her life. It must have caused an incredible kind of emotional stress. There must have been all kinds of things that were part of that experience. And when Jesus delivered her from those demons, she must have been, like, grateful <laughs> in ways we can't even understand or describe. Can you imagine how you would feel if you had seven demons and a preacher came and delivered you from those demons, you would just say to yourself, oh, I'm going to follow him until I die. I'm never going to leave this guy. He's my savior. He's my protector. He's, 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 he, he's making my life okay. And so when he was crucified, I believe she had a broken heart. My goodness, the guy who delivered me from my demons got crucified. What is that about? So we read in verse 11, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She must have run back with Peter and John to see what they were going to do. And then when they went home, she decided to stay there because she was overwhelmed and uh, she was weeping. And she bent over to look into the tomb. And so she began her own process of investigating. What's there? What does this mean? What can I understand from this? She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she said, they have taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? <laughs> Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary? And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Now the fact that she turned before she called Rabbi is an indication of why she didn't recognize him. She was crying. And she was probably hiding her face from this guy standing behind her. And she wasn't looking him in the eyes. She was looking down at the ground. But when she heard him call her name, as he had probably done many, many times, she immediately recognized that Galilean accent the tone of his voice and the acceptance that she experienced when he would call her name and she knew it was him. <laughs> Rabboni, she says. Oh my goodness, what an incredible thing. She had found the person that she was looking for. Verse 17, and Jesus said, do not hold on to me. The word there is actually cling as if she was clinging because she wasn't going to let go. <laughs> she, was, she had found the Savior and she was going to hold on to him as long as she could. But he tells her, Mary, don't cling to me. Don't hold me like you're never going to let me go because I've got a job for you. And so he tells her, I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. I love those verses in that, that passage because in this one verse, Jesus affirms Mary in all of her emotional experience. 
He says, Mary, you don't need to cling on to me. I've got a job for you to do, and I want you to go and tell the disciples. But what is he going to tell, ever tell them? And as you read through that, you've got to ask yourself, is this the message for the disciples? Is this the message for everybody? Is this also a message for, for Mary? What was Jesus saying? I've not ascended to my father, but I am going to ascend to my father and your father. Did you notice that? He includes her in that equation. And what he's doing is he's helping her to understand that something fundamental has changed in her relationship to God the Father. That she can now go to her God as a father who loves her and accepts her and forgives her because her sins have been paid for. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's affirming Mary that she now has a relationship with God as her father and that she has the same kind of relationship with God the Father that, that Jesus does. How does that work? And how do we build that into our ideas about God? This is pretty amazing. Don't hold on to me. Don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to my brothers and tell them, I am going to kill those chickens. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's not a prophecy. Denise, don't worry about that. I'm good. <clears throat> that's a distraction I'm going to put out of my mind so that I can focus on what I'm supposed to do here. And so Mary goes and she tells the disciples, she becomes the apostle to the apostles. She becomes God's messenger to the guys who are supposed to be God's messengers. She experiences something in her life that's amazing. Now, again, this passage and the details that we just read are a part of the, part of the, the they're part of the apologetic, the, 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 the legal argument for the truth of the gospel. Why? Well, many of the skeptics who don't believe in Christ and who don't believe the scriptures will argue that these stories were made up by the church 40 or 50 years after these events. And that what they are telling is, is a legend about who Jesus was and what her followers experienced. The only problem is that that ignores the fact that in Roman courts and Jewish courts in the first century, women were considered so unreliable that they weren't even allowed to give testimony. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. So why in the world would the gospel writers, all four of them, tell people that the first person who saw Jesus risen from the grave was a woman who, by the way, had grown up with seven demons, like a crazy woman? Well, if you were purporting a lie, if you were making up a fable, if you were telling a legend about Jesus and you wanted people to believe that, you absolutely would not tell this part of the story because it didn't add credibility in the first century. It actually added questions. Oh my goodness, if the per person who saw him alive was this, this crazy woman, can we really trust this story? And that detail is an important part of the apologetic for the gospel narrative. The only reason you tell that part of the story is because it's exactly what happened. And you don't have any agenda, you don't have any intentions, you're not trying to prove anything, you're just telling people exactly what happened. Oh my goodness. Well, and I love the fact that Jesus does honor Mary Magdalene as a woman with the privilege of being the very first person that saw the risen Jesus alive. Oh my goodness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul uh, quotes an early church formula about Jesus' resurrection. He talks about the fact that Jesus was risen from the grave and that he was seen by Peter and the apostles and by then by Thomas and then by several other people. And then he appeared to a crowd of 500 people. And then finally, he appeared to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus who saw the risen Jesus. <laughs> oh my goodness. And that's Paul's kind of formula for the gospel evidence of the resurrection. You notice he leaves out Mary Magdalene. Because he writes 1 Corinthians in about 50 A.D., so 20 years after the resurrection. And he's writing to a group of people who, who are tuned into first century culture, and they know that women's testimony doesn't count. But what Paul says is that this is the story that he received from the disciples when he was first saved as a Christian, which goes back to about 37 A.D., so this is the, the theological formula for the resurrection that Paul shares in 1 Corinthians 15, and it goes back to within five years of the resurrection. 
Oh my goodness, this is the earliest testimony coming out of the disciples in Jerusalem, and Paul shares it with us. Why? Because he wants us to understand that the truth hasn't changed. The culture may be different, but the truth hasn't changed. Now I'm going to jump down to the end of the chapter because I want to give you an illustration of what um, that, those first verses that I read to you um, lead to. The end of chapter 20, um, Jesus talks to Thomas. Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas. And uh, he's also known as Didymus because he was a twin. That was his nickname. Didymus in Greek means ditto. And so he was a twin. He was one of the twelve, but he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, and through the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, Now listen to this. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, I don't know how easy it is for you to understand the, the, the significance of that statement. But in the first century, a Jewish young man would never say that a human being could become God. The Jews anticipated a human Messiah to become king to drive out the oppressors, and to lead Israel into a, a future of blessing and success. He was a military leader, a general. He was an army commander. He was somebody who was going to deliver Israel from the Romans. When Jesus was crucified, that dream crashed. Jesus was no longer even qualified to do the deal. <laughs> what the Jews of the first century didn't know was that Jesus had a different plan. His plan wasn't to deliver Israel from the Romans. His plan was to deliver Israel from their sins. When the angel told Mary, hey, you're going to have this baby that's going to be conceived in you by the Holy Spirit, and I want you to call him Jesus. Why? Because they're, he's going to save his people from their, from their sins. God's plan for the Messiah wasn't to save Israel. It was to save the whole world. It was a much bigger plan. And so when the disciples experienced this disappointment his, at his crucifixion, they were thrown into a tizzy. What in the world does this mean, and how do I, what do I do with this? And Thomas was a skeptic. He wasn't going to believe until he could see it and touch it. But when Jesus offered the evidence to him, how did he respond? Oh my goodness, you are my Lord. My kurios, which was the Greek word that the Jews used when they would come to the name of God in the Old Testament. They would be reading along and it would say, and Yahweh met with Moses. Well, they didn't want to say the, the name of God wrong because that was a violation of the Ten Commandments. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so they wouldn't say Yahweh as they read the passage. They would substitute the word Lord, which was the Greek word kurios. And Thomas knew this because when he read the Bible in the synagogue, that's what he would do. He would come to the name Yahweh and he would say kurios because he didn't want to say Yahweh wrong. And then he says, my theos, and there's no other interpretation from that. In the text, it actually has an article, the God, <laughs> not a God, not some kind of God, not a different kind of God, but the God. Thomas says, my Lord and my the God. <laughs> In other words, see what Thomas was saying? Hey, I recognize Jesus not only as the Son of God or the Son of Man or the prophet or the teacher, but I recognize that He is God. He made these promises and He rose Himself from the grave on the third day. Oh my goodness, that's something we can believe in. Now, one of the things that's part of the theology of the gospel is two verses that I want to share with you, and I'm going to end with these two verses. Isaiah 53, verse 5 Isaiah is describing this Messiah that would come to deliver Israel. And he says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. And scholars believe that refers to the spear that the Romans shoved into Jesus' side to see if he was dead or not. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Is that a great verse? It describes what Jesus was doing on the cross at Calvary. He was taking the punishment for our sins. Then Peter confirms that in 1 Peter 2.24. He says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Oh my goodness. But how do we see that? How do we know that? How do we read the story of the crucifixion of Jesus and come away with that reality? Well, we come away with that reality because the resurrection is the, is the stamp that says, paid, done, it is finished. The resurrection that we celebrate on Easter is the reassurance that Jesus is who he said he was, that he keeps his promises, and that he does what he said he would do. Now, I'd like to share a little gift with you this morning. And it's not a crucifix, it's a cross. It's, a, it's an empty cross. And let's see if I can get some help passing this around, maybe. Brandon, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Just pass one around to everybody. One of the things that I want you to remember about this cross, put it in your pocket until you lose it. That takes about three days for me to lose stuff I put in my pocket. You know, put it in your watch pocket, put it in your purse, put it somewhere. But let it remind you that this cross is empty. And what the empty cross means is that the work of Christ has been finished. There's no sins on this cross. There's nothing left because Jesus has paid for our sins. Now, I don't know about you, but it's hard to understand what that means. I spent a lot of time in my life trying to figure out how to pay for my sins. I spent a lot of my time in my life listening to pastors and teachers teach me how to do proper penance for sins. I've never understood what that means. Because first of all is that Romans chapter 14, 28 says that uh, if we, whatever we do that's not of faith, which means if we don't believe God has actually directed us to do it, that's sin. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's called the sin of omission. And I think most of my, thing, most of my sin in my life is not you know, Ten Commandments kind of sin. Murdering people and committing terrible acts and lying and stealing and stuff like that. Most of my sin is sins of omission. It's the sins that I don't do. It's the things that I know that God wants me to do, but I don't do them. How do you pay for those things? How do you, how do you even know how many things those are if you're not even aware of what those sins are sometimes? Oh my goodness. Our problem with sin is not fixable. Let me tell you a story about a guy who lied about a co-worker and got him fired. Ooh, that's scary stuff, isn't it? How do you pay for that sin? Well, the co-worker couldn't come up with a job, couldn't pay his mortgage. He lost his house, and he lost about $100,000 in equity in his home when the bank foreclosed. The stress of that situation blew up his marriage. His wife filed for divorce, and his four children were raised in a home without a dad. How do you pay for those sins? You see, sin isn't just something you pay for. Oh, I, I made a lie. No, you didn't make a lie. You did something that had consequences. How do you pay for that sin? Well, if you came to me and said, well, I lied and got my coworker fired and he lost his house and he lost his marriage and his kids were raised in a home without a dad, I'd say, oh, okay. Well, how do you pay for those sins? Well, let's see. You pray the Lord's Prayer every day for 35 years until those kids are all 20, you know, and they're, they're out of that house. And you donate $100 a, a week to the church every week for 20 years until you've paid back that $100,000 in equity that that guy lost. And then as a pastor, I, I would say you'd have to hire a maid to replace the wife that he lost. And you'd have to hire a cook to cook him meals and do his laundry. And you'd have to hire somebody to, to replace that loss in his life. And then, then how do you pay for four kids who are growing up without a father? Well, I guess you'd have to form an organization and get some dads to volunteer to go down and be fathers for those kids and, and help them work through some of the issues that they need to take. Now, that's what I would call penance for sin. <laughs> Can you imagine? You told a lie. And you're going to spend the next 30 years of your life paying for that sin. If we take the concept of payment for sin seriously. You see, and that's the thing. We have no idea how to pay for sin. We have no ability to pay for sin. When we think about the idea that our sins are paid for, that can only happen from God. 
God is the only one who can figure out how to do it. He's the only one who can understand what the, what the cost actually is. And he's the only one who can actually do what he needs to do in order to make up for that sin. <laughs> Wahoo. And so the gospel is not talking about helping us figure out how to pay for our sin. The gospel is helping us figure out how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because he already paid for our sin. Is that great or what? <laughs> I love it. He went to the cross and he took our sins there in his body and he paid for those sins. And I can't explain how it works or how it, how it, how it happened or what God did, but I believe in my heart that we will understand that when we get to the judgment day. We are going to see Jesus proclaim judgment, judgment about the sin that we've all committed. And we're going to understand for the first time probably in history how much sin cost and how much Christ had to pay in order to cover up our sin. Oh my goodness, judgment day. And I'm actually looking forward to it because I'm not worried that God is going to reject me. I know he's, he's, he's paid for my sin. I know that as a believer, I'm going to stand before the throne of God and I'm going to be excited about, about understanding and experiencing the justice of God throughout the entire world. And I hope that you will be able to join me in that. I hope that you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you've already come to the conclusion that God has forgiven my sin and I don't have to worry about it or pay for it or deal with it because Jesus has taken care of it. And if you're still thinking that you can take care of your own, that you can do it on your own without his help, I just got to caution you this morning. That's not probably going to be an effective plan. I'd love for you to explain how you're going to do that. Because I don't think I can. And I don't think you can. Because the Bible says we cannot pay for our sin. Only Jesus could pay for our sin.